A wonderful good morning to those that have joined in with us on Facebook Live. We are so thankful for your presence. Uh, we have a good crowd with us even this morning, and we're so thankful for them being here. And for those that are visiting with us, we are so grateful for your presence as well. And as always, we invite you to come back and be with us at every opportunity that you may have. We love to have visitors, and we would love to for you to be a part of our congregation here. And so if you're interested in looking for a church home, as always, we invite you to consider the work here. And I know that our elders will be more than happy to sit down with you and meet with you to discuss the work of the church here. Let's go to God in prayer as we get started. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and glorious name. As we approach thy throne of grace, we come as humbly as we know how, thanking thee for the many blessings that we're able to enjoy, the blessings of our homes and our cars, and the ability to be here amidst this pandemic crisis. And Father, we are so thankful that so many have decided to want to be here. And But Father, we understand that many are unable to be out. And Father, we pray that our richest blessings upon them. Father, we pray that you'll be with Maddie and Dimitri at this time in the loss of Devonda, and I know that she will be greatly missed, but Father, we ask thee to watch over them, and may they look unto thee and thy word for the strength and the comfort during this troubled time. But Father, we ask thee to be with us as we study thy word, that we'll take those things and learn them and obey them and apply them to our hearts and minds so that we can be better servants for thee. Be where our missionaries in the world over and what they're doing to spread the borders of thy kingdom and be with us here as we spread the borders of thy kingdom right here in this community as well. Father, forgive us in the end, save us if we've been found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles, if you will, to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, we'll look at verses 11 and 12. James 4, 11 and 12. James writes by inspiration, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? We want to continue our series on the one another church. And as you probably were able to assess there in James 4 and verse 11, that we're to speak not evil one of another. There's also another passage in Galatians 5.15 that sounds very similar to this. It's a, it's a one another passage. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This is the first time that we are considering one of these passages as a negative statement, a negative statement. Brethren, he says, speak not evil one of another. You see, as Christians, we are constantly being challenged to use our tongues in a very productive and also edifying manner. James 3 and verse 6 reminds us that the tongue is a fire. It's a, a world of iniquity. So we have to be careful what we say on every occasion. And this instrument can be used for so much good, but as we learn, it can be used of the evil ways as well, a destructive force. And so what James is condemning here in James 4, 11 is censorious or harsh comments that we might make toward other people. Oftentimes, based upon assumptions and many times motivated by nothing else than mean-spiritedness. And so we find that that talk is condemned. But Jesus said something about that as well. In fact, if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, you might remember there in Matthew chapter 7, 
Jesus talked about making judgmental statements when he said in verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why? Beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite? First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt be able to see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And so we see that both Jesus and James condemning harsh, censorious, or hypocritical judgments or comments that are judgmental. Now understand this about judging. We need to know what it's not. Judging, for example, is not the condemnation of sin. Now the world seems to know a few passages in particular The world knows very well Matthew 7, 1. They will tell you quickly, if you said something to them, judge not that you be not judged. When a certain particular activity is being condemned, they will say, well, wait a minute, don't judge me, right? Well, in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, we read that we are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Paul, what is Paul talking about here? He's talking about the evil actions that in that passage. We're not about the condemnation of people. But remember what Jesus stated in John 7 and verse 24 when he said, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John three seventeen. We understand that, not the condemnation of people, but perhaps the actions, right? of individuals. That's what we're judging is the actions, not the people. But it's also not the condemnation of religious error. For example, in Matthew 7, Jesus made this statement, judge not that you be not judged. But then he goes on to say in verses 15 and 16 of that chapter, he says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Well, that's interesting. We can judge them based upon their fruits. Does that not suggest some type of judgment? Yes, it does. Paul himself was set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1.17. And so we're talking about harsh, censorious judgment. Assumptions that are made without having all the facts. You see... There is a standard that we must use when making judgment. And if it's not our own, that's what we must remember. It's not our own judgment that we should be calling, right? The standard that we use is not our own because Jesus stated in John 7 and verse 24, he says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's right. Now, here's something else that we should consider. Who is the righteous judge? Well, Christ Jesus is the righteous judge, isn't he? He judges according to what? According to a righteous standard. In John 12 and verse 48, he says that his righteous standard is his word. And so the words that I have spoken, Jesus said, the same shall judge him in the last day. So, Here's a righteous judge. There is a righteous standard, but there's also a righteous judgment. But when, what is Jesus talking about and what is James talking about? Each one says, be careful about your comments. Be careful about judging others. They're talking about something that is simple. You know, Jesus knew the hearts of men and women. John 2, 25. He knew what was in man. He was God incarnate, God in the flesh. And so he knew what was in man. We did not always know that. We did not always 
uh, have that same privilege that Jesus had, we might be tempted to judge other people's actions and uh, without having a clear understanding of the facts many times. But without always understanding the motive behind somebody's actions, right? Therefore, James would also write in James 1.19 that we should be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Very, very important we understand that. Slow to speak. Don't be making any rash judgments until you got all the facts. I suppose one particular scholar that is admired and respected as much as any other among those in the Lord's church is the late Diane Woods. Brother Woods said concerning this subject, he says, Do not cultivate a harsh, bitter, or fault-finding spirit that looks on the ill side of persons and actions. And that seeks to do evil in others so that you can find fault or complain. You know, when we hear something that, that is negative about somebody else, what is your reaction? What is your reaction when you hear that something that is, that is negative about somebody? When a person is called in some particular moral crisis, particularly if it's somebody you don't like, What is your reaction? You see, we need to be careful how we react, especially to that individual. I remember when there was a woman taken in the very act of adultery, according to John chapter 8. The enemies of Jesus had brought that woman and they placed her in front of him, right? According to John 8, did they care about embarrassing her? No, they didn't care at all. Jesus did not approve of her actions, but he was not about to embarrass her either. But those who speak evil about another don't mind embarrassing. They don't mind embarrassing somebody else. And Jesus warns us about judging others when we are guilty of that same sin. Now, I want you to remember that in Matthew 7, 4 and 5, he says, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out of the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You see, Paul addressed this also in Romans 2, in verse 1, when he says, Therefore... Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever that thou judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For for thou that judgest do the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, thou judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. And so this begs the question this morning, how do we overcome this evil of speaking against another, judging one another? I believe that there are some practical ways in which we can overcome this very thing. Number one, we must become conscientious of it. We've got to become conscientious of the fact that we sometimes engage in this behavior. Go back to James chapter 4. I want you to notice there in verse 11 again, where James says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. But notice verse 12, where Jesus says that there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou, who art thou that judgest another? We need to become conscientious of judging other people. Now, this text tells us that there's only one judge, and I'm glad that he is the judge. I am glad, and you'll probably be glad that he is the judge too, because I might put you where you don't belong. Or I might go, yeah, that's right. See, we, you might put me where I don't belong. But you see how it is that we're glad that Jesus is the judge. I'm glad that on that day when we stand before someone in judgment, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he always judges righteously. That's right. 
He always has the facts at his disposal. He always understands the heart of man. Now, we do know this. There will be a judgmental day. There will be a judgment day, and everyone will have to give an account of their own lies before the righteous judge. But it will be before God, right? Notice Romans 14.10. Here again, the subject is judging somebody else. He says, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow unto me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now on that particular day, when we are to be judged, we will be judged according to to our work, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Based on that fundamental fact, doesn't it make sense that if we're going to be judged according to our works, that we need to get busy out there saving others from the judgment day or from that time of being judged wrongly? Shouldn't that be our number one first priority? 2 Corinthians 5.10 speaks of the fact that we will stand before Christ to be judged. But in verse 11 of that text, Paul continues by saying, with that understanding, knowing there's going to be that judgment, he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That ought to be our priority. That ought to be our number one focus about somebody instead of judging Saving somebody instead of judging another. Now, since we will one day be judged, we better be careful about doing any judging ourselves. Harsh, condemning, judgmental attitudes are something that we ought to avoid because conscientious of judging others, to become conscientious. But also realize this. In and of ourselves, we are incapable of judging. We've already noticed that the Bible speaks of righteous judgment. And it's all right for us to say what the Bible says, that this is right or this is wrong. I was just telling somebody just, just the other day about that very thing. Well, that's what you think. And I said, no, that's what the Bible says. Is it because I always had to go back? according to book, chapter, and verse, that's what's going to judge you in the last day. Not what I say. But the Bible will. And so we need to be very careful when we have the attitude that says, why, I would never want to do that, or I would never do that. You don't know what you may or may not do in a particular situation. That's interesting. Just stick with the righteous standard, because why? It applies to all of us. The righteous standard always applies to all of us. Jesus used the illustration of the moat and then the beam to show how ridiculous it can be when we engage in this type of judgment upon people, right, of other people. And so when we consider our own lives, how we so many times miss the mark. When we consider how often it is when we don't have all the facts of a particular situation at our disposal. We would do well to heed the words of our Lord and and of James himself, to judge not that ye be not judged, or speak not evil one of another. Sometimes we are incapable of judging because we don't know a person's particular situation. We have heard the old Native American proverb that says, never judge another man until you have walked a mile in his moccasins. That would be something that we need to remember on. Never judge another man until you have walked a mile in his moccasins. Now, I don't, I don't know what all of you might have to face in life. You don't know what all I had to face in life. Or what might have caused you to have a particular decision. Or what made you stumble and fall. You don't know that about me. Therefore, we need to be very careful when it comes to judging and leave that judging in the hands of the Lord, right? Sometimes we're guilty of rushing to judgment without understanding the facts in that particular situation. And we end up embarrassing ourselves 
when we make the wrong judgment. Back in the days when it was quite common to travel by rail, railroad, there was a man who was on a long journey traveling from the west to the east. And since it was such a long journey, he decided to close his eyes and he tried to, to get some rest. And all of a sudden, he was awakened by a baby that was crying. The baby was just across the aisle from him. The father was trying to, to calm the child, but it was not working. And this man who was trying to sleep became more and more frustrated to the point that he, he became agitated. Until finally he looked over at the man and he said, Sir, he said, will you not do something to get that baby to be quiet? Will you not go get its mother? Some of us are trying to sleep. To which the man responded, Sir, if I could, I would gladly go and get this child's mother. But she's in the very back car in a coffin and I'm taking her home to bury her. You see, those were the facts. That man was more worried about his sleep than he was about understanding a person's situation and understanding the facts. That's what he didn't know. He assumed he understood the situation, but he really didn't. And it came back to embarrass him in a poignant kind of way. When we are tempted to criticize anybody, somebody, maybe we ought to take the advice of one of the well-known comedians of the past, Red Skelton. Red Skelton said this, whenever somebody wronged him, whenever he perceived a wrong, whenever his feelings had been hurt, that he would get a glass of hot tea, he would go out into a little room that he had built, and there he would sit down and he would relax and he would start thinking about that person who wronged him. He would start thinking of all the good things about that person. He would think about the good qualities that was in that individual and it helped him to overcome this spirit of judging other people unfairly. You say, well, somebody really did me wrong. You just don't know my particular situation. I have been hurt badly. Probably so. Probably so. But I also remember that they put our Lord on the cross and people did him wrong. And yet, he was still able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when we are tempted to gossip, speak not evil one of another. That's what gossip is, evil speaking about another. Speak not evil about another. When we are tempted to gossip, let me tell you something. You need to stop yourself immediately and don't do it. Don't do it. And when somebody comes to you ready to gossip, you let your ears be the graveyard of that message, that gossip. Don't let it go on anymore. Stop it in its tracks right then. Somebody said, well, I, I don't say anything about anybody else unless it's good, and boy, is this good. No. No. You're about to hear something about another, and when you get somebody to come to you with gossip, here's what you can do. You can, you can write this down. No, no, you can say, hey, can I write this down? Can I, can I quote you on this? They'll be very careful about saying anything more of that gossip. James says, speak not evil about another. Don't repeat something about somebody else that would be hurtful or harmful. In fact, the three things that we need to consider before you start anything negative about anybody. Number one, is it true? Is it true? Am I sure this is true? And then number two, if I must say it, is it kind about this person? Number three, is it necessary? Is it necessary? I've heard this before. Why? It is the truth. But it may not be necessary to state. It may not be 
helpful to the situation, even though it may be true. Here's a passage that has helped me, and it's found in Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. That's right. You see the situation, you might not know all the facts about it, but before you say something, you stand back, you look at the whole picture, and you think about it before you say something. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. But notice in that same passage, he goes on to say, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. And what is our subject today? Speak not evil one of another. When you're tempted to criticize, try to understand that person you're criticizing. Try to see things from that person's vantage point. And remember this, other people have weaknesses. Well, we do, don't we? Other people have weaknesses, but so do we. I'm certain of this, that God understands our weaknesses. In Psalm 103, one of my favorite passages, and probably one of yours as well, in verse 13 of that chapter, it says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Why? The next verse answers that. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. He remembered how he created us and he loves us as a father and he also remembers that we are made from the dust of the ground. That means he understands us and he understand in his understanding toward us. And then of course as we have in all of these sermons we just want to follow the example of Jesus, right? Jesus did become angry, didn't he, on occasion? He became angry over traditionalism and formalism and over corrupt institutions. He could become angry over error being taught or sin in the lives of others. But he never did fly off the handle, did he? Never. In fact, on one occasion recorded in Luke 9, we find Jesus wanting to go through Samaria. And he sent some messengers ahead of them to prepare the way. But they would not let him go, come through. Not those in one particular village. And it was on this occasion that James and John says, You know what we should do? Lord, let's bring down fire from heaven. And that will settle that problem. Oh, really? Demonstrate your power, Lord, to which Jesus said, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save others. Luke 9, 56. To save them. Following his example, we say only those things that glorify him. When you see someone you want to speak evil against, remember God loves that person's soul just as much as he loves yours. That's right. That's right. You go back to that text. Remember what James says, James 4.11. He says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. James says, when you engage in this kind of activity, you have said this, I don't have to obey the word of God. That's what in essence you're saying. Instead of being a doer, you have now become a judge. We are to be doers of the law, not censors of people. Now, let's not be guilty of destroying people by speaking evil against them. The name is precious. There is nothing more vile or despicable, despicable than to hurt another's reputation. To, to deliberately or ruin another good's name or even mar another's character. I, I know that a, a person can do that to himself, but I'm talking about doing this to another. 
And after all, in Romans 8, we read this passage in verse 34, when he says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. If you don't read that carefully, you might come away with a misunderstanding of the meaning. Who is he that condemneth? It is not saying that Christ who condemns, not at all. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for you and me. Think about that. We don't need to be in the condemnation business. Our Lord is not in it. He came to say, who is he that condemns you? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about those who might condemn you. And don't you dare do that to somebody else. After all, Christ Jesus died and is risen again. And is at the right hand of God. And he makes intercession for us. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Brethren, this morning, if you're watching online and you're subject to our Lord's invitation, I want to encourage you to make things right, to respond to the good news of the gospel by hearing the word of God and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, by repentance of your sins and then making that good confession of the sweet name of Jesus, being buried in that watery grave for the remission of your sins, to be able to put the Lord on and to be able to rise from that watery grave to walk in newness of life, a Christian, a child of God, ready to take on the world and Satan. And we hope that you'll even do that this morning. You might be already a child of God and you wandered away. We only ask that you come back. Let it be known that you want to make things right even now.